Well, the Shroud of Turin is back today, and we're taking a closer look at what it can reveal to us about just how much our Lord suffered for us and how much he loves us. I'll be right back. Hey there, Gracious Gang. It's Mike Creepy from thegraciousguest.org. Back with you today for another installment of the Gracious Guest Show, and I'm really delighted today to dive back into this topic of the Shroud of Turin with a new guest, Mr. Bill Wingard. I'm going to talk to you about Bill here in just a second, but before I do that, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, share this far and wide. If you're listening to the audio podcast, a very, very dear welcome to you as well. Please make sure you do whatever you can on whatever platform you're using to listen to the show to leave us a good review share it somehow, give us a good rating. I know Spotify, you can do that. You can do it on iTunes and and so many other different podcast aggregators. So thank you all, video, audio, however you're getting the gracious guest. Thank you for being here. As I mentioned, Mr. Bill Wingard uh, is on the show here today. And there's a really fun uh, backstory of how Bill and I met. And I just, I share it in the interview section. So I won't spoil that just yet, but, uh, Bill's biography, uh, reads as follows. I'm just going to share it with you. He sent it to me earlier. So Mr. Bill Wingard is the speaker for Shroud Talks, which is dedicated to presenting the history, the science, and the passion of Jesus Christ as seen in the Shroud of Turin, one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the world and which many believe to be the actual burial cloth of Jesus Christ. Bill attended Mary Knoll Seminary in Glen Ellen, Illinois for one year and graduated from Xavier University in Cincinnati with a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. Bill and his wife Karen raised their family in Maryland and recently moved to Pennsylvania. Bill is retired from the family metal stamping manufacturing business for 40 years. He actually talks about that quite a bit, which is a really interesting experience. And he is now committing the balance of his life's work to presenting both the Shroud and its message to churches, schools, organizations, prisons, in short, whoever asks him. And so I asked him, (laughs) and he was very gracious enough to share his time with us. So without further ado, let's jump into this exploration of the Shroud and the Passion of Jesus with Mr. Bill Wingard. Check it out. Okay, Bill Wingard, thank you so much for being my gracious guest today. Thank you for having me. It's exciting. I mean, I I never uh, shy away from the opportunity to, uh, to talk to anyone about the shroud here and and just if i may share really quickly before i ask you about your own background i don't believe in coincidence and i think it's hilarious i was visiting a, a friend of mine the priest uh, who who married my wife and i father wilkie down in uh, new freedom pennsylvania happened yeah. to pop in the little chapel as i was leaving from meeting with him for lunch that day right and the only other person in that chapel is you <laughs> <laughs> and and you know and I just said, hello. And, you know, just, just, you know, and you, you handed me this, this shroud talks card. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. So this <laughs> meant, meant to be. So, uh, yeah, you want to share with our audience here, just a little bit about yourself and kind of how you sure. got acquainted with the shroud. Yes. I, I, uh, it's interesting because I was working in manufacturing. Uh, we, uh, my father started a metal stamping company and we were making, a lot of parts that were highly sensitive uh, to an extent. He developed a new process for doing stuff. And Mm -hmm. so I worked in that business for about 40 years. But Uh in uh, in 1980, I heard a talk given by a fellow who had been with the U.S. team in Turin, Italy, when they examined the shroud in 1978. And so Mm -hmm. he was describing to us what it was all about. And I was absolutely captivated. My wife said, I can't believe it. You remembered every single thing he said in the talk. And he didn't write anything down, but there was just <laughs> something about it that just resonated with me. And I kind of put that on the back burners. And then in, when I was uh, uh, 70, I felt that uh, um, I needed you know, to retire. I was getting to the point, 40 years, it, it's it's about time, I figured. But I also didn't know quite what God wanted me to do. So mm. I retired and I had a sense from him. It's very simple. He just said, I want you to tell my story. And, yeah. and I realized that that had been submerged in me. I've been doing a lot of reading about the Shroud and so forth. And I I did. I actually got involved. I became involved with Barry Schwartz. I went out to Colorado to his house out there on the backside wow. of, uh, of 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 one of the tall mountains out there, and uh, he really 
took me through the shroud and then I purchased a copy, an actual photocopy of the shroud from him because he had worked with a Hollywood studio that was able to recreate the photos he took in mm. 1978. So I have an exact reproduction of that. But then I had to study a lot. And I had him plus Russ Breo, who's the U.S. Education yes. Director for the Shroud. And uh, we uh, worked together to develop the talk. But hmm. my talk is a little different. Um, I've investigated everything from the history of the Shroud to the science of the Shroud. But when I get to the passion, I get blown away by it. Now, I am yeah. Roman Catholic. But I do start the passion with the Last Supper because I felt that the Last Supper was crucial to the whole ball game. that yes. Jesus knew it was. And this was the most important meal probably in the history of, of mankind in many ways because he gave us his, his – uh, he said the prayers that converted the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Hmm. As Catholics, we, we believe that. And um, so I start the passion with that. But what really hit me when I got my copy of the shroud and it came to my house and I opened up the box and I opened it up and I laid it out and I hung it up and I looked at it. I was absolutely blown away. <laughs> uh, nothing had hit me quite like that. When I saw the scourge marks on the body, I couldn't believe it front and back. I mean, yeah. it was like the entire gospel is on the shroud, the right. whole ball game, and then some that wasn't in the gospel that was written about by Isaiah when he said, they lashed my back and they plucked my beard. Mm -hmm. And they literally had pulled out, if you look at the face on the shroud, which I have behind yeah, me, is right. probably a little yeah. harder to see, but right, right. But, the, uh, but you can see the empty hole right there. That's where they pulled his beard. That's the highest form of insult mm. you can do to somebody in the Middle East is to pull out their beard. Yeah. And and basically the story of the passion is the story of the total, the total humiliation of God. Right. Like you wouldn't believe. And, well, that's and, even even now that I'm, I've, I've been yeah. growing this out a little longer than I've ever had it before. And like the girls, like my, I have a six year old and a three year old. Yeah. And, you know, they're messing around with me and just like pulling like that. It, it, yeah. it hurts. It really <laughs> more, does. More than you'd think it would. Oh, so, that, yes, man. I can't can't they imagine. Just yanked it yeah. out. Mm. And and the stuff they did to him, they beat him up. You can see the black eye and um, his hair. A lot of people don't realize he had his hair in a ponytail which I mm. believe I, I'm one of these guys. Okay. I do believe the shroud's the real thing, but I also say in my talks that whether it's the real thing or not, it's the most perfect representation of the love of God for us that uh -huh. we could ever hope to see. Mm. It's all in there. The lashings, the spear in the side, the nails in the, in the, uh, in the, in the wrists and um, in the feet. The whole ball game, every aspect, and then of course the growing evidence now for the resurrection that the shroud contains, which is really remarkable. Right. Well, and that's so. I mean, I always ask people. I mean, we my channel we've covered different. Uh, I guess technically, I was going to say focuses, but I learned it's foci, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the, these different angles, these different uh, things, like I've talked about the like you said too, you know, the history, the different levels of the scientific considerations. But I do tend to ask folks, or it usually comes up when you have folks who were around for that, that, that first kind of stretch uh, in the, the wake of the Sturp team's work right. up to that, that 1988 carbon dating. I mean, for you personally, I'm just curious, you know, when, when that news came out, uh, how did that affect you? Did, did that, I mean, did that make you go deeper into investigating? Was there a period where you sort of stepped away? I, I was just curious. No, I think that the carbon dating, I tend to agree with Ray Rogers, who is the chief chemist that they consulted. Um, Benfield, she's, she's a lady, was a, mm -hmm. an engineer. Yes, uh, she yeah. went with Barry to, to Ray Rogers and said, hey, um, you were there. Um, and he said, well, they already said it was middle ages. And she said, no, I want you to take, go and take your, your, uh, microscope and, 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 and please 
put your electron microscope on this area. And she had a piece of the cloth mm -hmm. and, and he did that. And, and his eyes got big and he said, Oh my goodness. He said, this thing's been tampered with. And he mm -hmm. realized they'd put cotton in, into the segment that they tested, which meant that that was when they repaired it was back in the middle ages. Mm -hmm. And they, they see, they did work on tapestries back then. They were experts. I mean, you go to the Vatican museum, you'll see the tapestries of the middle ages yep. and they could repair them. And you never knew how they did it, how they repaired sure. it. They were so good. Trade and, secret. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, but I believe yeah. that's exactly what happened is it was the repaired portion that they tested. So it probably tested correctly for Middle Ages, but then they come up with the Prey Manuscript, which really yeah. put the issue right to rest right then and there because they know that the Prey Manuscript was in Constantinople, and that takes it right back to the 1100s. Mm -hmm. So you've got a whole different ball game on your hands. So I believe that sure. they tested the wrong piece, and that's why they had the results they got. Gotcha. And so for for you, um, I know now what kind of settings have you given your talks in or what if I'm, I'm just I have a lot of questions, but I'm just curious what what sort of settings and, and maybe a little bit about the reception you've seen as far as, as you know, yeah. maybe in general versus different age groups. Or I'm just curious yeah. what your experience has been in presenting on the shroud. I've I've I, I'm just blown away by the reception that I do get. I have uh, I spoke like it's my talk is on YouTube and that's the one that I gave yeah. at uh, St. Benedict's. I have it linked below. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so many people come up after that, and many of them were crying. Mm. And I have that happen many times after my talk. People are just, they see Jesus in a whole new way. They say, I never saw Jesus this way. I'm blown away. Because when they see the shroud and they get up close, and it's like, I have both that copy and I have a copy of the Kodak um, negative. And most people, like even when they had the Shroud exhibit in Washington, D.C. at the uh, I went to that at, at mm -hmm. the U.S. Uh, museum that they have for the Bible yeah. at the Bible Museum. They didn't have that Kodak picture and you can't That's get strange. it. You, you really can't get it now. But I have two of them that are pretty big, mm -hmm. about 30, you know, maybe maybe a, a, a yard and a half long by a yard wide or something. But it's it shows everything. Mm -hmm. And that picture just blows everybody when they go over and see that and they can see the lash marks. It's just incredible. All the things that were revealed by the neg the actual negative itself. Sure. So so that's um, I, I don't have, by the way, I, I don't have like a, a, a I have a simple one. It's back here behind me somewhere rolled up. But it, it was just something I got online that was relatively lower in price. But it gets the initial point across. But the reason I bring it up is. In my in my slides, I use yes, um, and I just did this recently for the first time. Um, part of my OCD kicking in, but I have one slide that shows you know just the the kind of naked eye frontal image, and it's kind of like laid on its right. side, so it, it fills the whole screen. And then I have it perfectly lined up with that that three D one or the, right. the the negative image one, the negative image, the black and white one. Yeah, that you know I, I go back and forth. You know it, it really just pops because it's it's lined up. Your eyes are already kind of looking for it, and then exactly. it just jumps out. And that's that's really effective. I found for myself. You well, know, you know it was too. interesting because when I talked to Barry Schwartz, Barry's an interesting guy. He's Jewish, yeah. and um, you know a lot of people try try and convert him, but but I he he believes the shroud's the real deal. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he has a slightly harder time with the resurrection, but, but right. people have had a major time trying to explain the image. The image right. baffles people. And, and yet I believe the image is the key to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, when I, uh, uh, but, but Barry said for 17 years, he didn't believe the shroud was the real thing, even though he was with the scientific crew in 78. Mm -hmm. that did all the examination. He said, because the blood is, is red and he couldn't, he said it wouldn't normally be red. It would, it turned to Brown, you know, like you cut right. yourself, it's bright red. The next day it's Brown. But then he got, he was addressed by another doctor who was there who said, Barry, you don't know what you're looking at. That is Billy Rubin. And he said, well, wait a minute, explain to me. Well, when you have a sustained violent death, which is what the crucifixion is. 
Absolutely. The blood converts, the liver converts the blood to bilirubin. And bilirubin never loses its red color. And that's mm. why today the Shroud of Turin in Turin, Italy still has a bright red, although it's a little duller, but it has, still has a bright red color to the blood. Mm. And I thought that was, he said, that did it for me. I, I uh, That was my one hang up. And he said that that got me over the hump. But yeah. I, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, because I, I was it's it's this and there's so many things we'll, we'll, we'll probably get to others, too, that um, comes up a lot in my conversations with folks about it is, uh, you know, does that pr does that prove it's Jesus's, you know, shroud? Not necessarily, but we're talking about, you know, if the gospel is true and if he did go through what he went through, knowing what we now know, not me, but, you know, chemists, people know sure. me, what, what happens to human blood, real human blood when it's subjected to this or to that or, you know. Right. And that's what's so fascinating to me is how I keep learning more all the time about there isn't one thing I've seen yet that in any way contradicts that. And beyond that, there's so many of those details. How many people could possibly have known about any of them 800 yes. years ago? Yes. <laughs> oh, know? yeah. And you'd have to get them all right. You get one of them wrong and your hoax falls apart. At least now, like you know, it might make it 800 years tricking people, but it gets mm -hmm. to this point where now we're analyzing it at this level. And that's so fascinating to me. Well, I went back and, and I've read the book. Uh, I think Walsh is his name. He wrote a book about the shroud and he covered extensively Secundo Pia's observation when he discovered that the shroud was a photographic negative when he took a picture of it in turn. Then he took it down to the basement of the apartment he was in. And he pulls it out and they describe what he went through. They said his knees buckled. Mm. Tears started to come down his eyes because he said, I am looking at the face of Jesus. <laughs> and that was the negative that was really a positive. I mean, that's never happened before. Yeah. It just, it just, it blew him out of the water and people thought he jury rigged it, but his reputation right. as a as a photographer, his reputation was he never would do that. He would never touch any photo up that he took. The picture that he took, he always showed exactly what he got. And uh, But for 30 years, he had to live with the reputation of being a fraud until right. it was re-examined again, the same results. And who I've always who was that second photographer? Do you recall? I can't remember. Because it was like in the 19... I think 30, 20s or 30s, it was, like you said, it was a while later that he was vindicated, but it wasn't. Yeah. Like, you know, he faced some struggles for that. It, it may have been Aldo Grisheri. Okay. I gotta um, look that up. I it was out. another Italian that right. took the picture. Okay. And, and, and when he got the same results, that, that kind of validated everything that, because, you know, they only show the shroud every so often. They didn't show it for another 30 years right. after, after Secundo took the picture. So. But eventually sure. he was vindicated that that uh, what he did was correct, that, that he, yeah. I mean, it, it just blows your mind. But the thing that, that the reason that I give my talks is I tell people, I said, look, you may or may not believe the shrouds are the real thing. But I said, I have never seen anything that shows so perfectly, so exactly, without a word being written, everything that's in the Gospels. <laughs> Yeah. Without a word being written, I said, it's just amazing. And, 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 and so even if you see it that way, that say somehow somebody was able to copy it, but everybody that's looked at it, all the doctors and so forth say, no, there's nobody could copy this because it has all the little intricacies of the human body in it that, that a, a photographer, or a, a painter could never have, or, you know, never captured. Right. Well, and it's, and it's so it's so um crisp right it's it's so the high resolution yep. uh, nature of it is is truly profound you know oh. um it gives me chills every time i look <laughs> well i think that's what blew away pierre barbe cuz he was a forensic pathologist and he wrote sure. the book the passion of the christ and uh it's not the passion of the christ his book the, was uh, the um, uh, physician at uh, calvary or uh, doctor Cal calvary. yeah 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 calvary mm -hmm. yeah the, Dr. Calvary. And, uh, but I mean, he was convinced that this, mm -hmm. that this was the real thing. He said, because everything checks out. Yeah. Everything wow. checks out. He said, I'm a forensic pathologist. I look at dead bodies all the time. And this 
showed me that this was the real thing. This was this was the body, and also the body of somebody who had been through crucifixion. Um, Frederick Zugaby, who was the forensic pathologist for the state of New York, he spent 50 years analyzing the shroud, and 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 he believes he believes the real thing. He says this this is this is the real thing. Um, hmm. The more he looked at it, he even used his kids <laughs> <laughs> to to study the effects of crucifixion on the human body. And, and and all the different things that he found. He wrote a book on the blood and and what Jesus went through. He felt that the worst pain that Jesus went through was literally the crowning of thorns. Mm. He said nothing hurt more than that because the all the nerve endings are up on your scalp. Even though it only goes, you know, you hit the skull right away, the nerve endings are between there and the skull. And when they put those crown on, on them and beat it down. He said the pain was like lightning bolts going through your body. Mm. He said, there's nothing like it. Every time his head, like they kept it on his head, even when he was on the cross. And if yeah. he put his head back or in any way touched it, it would send, even though he was getting all the pain from the nails in his hands and in his feet and struggling mm. for breath, that pain was excruciating. And, <laughs> and, but I thought that was interesting. And, oh. The whole story of the passion, the more I read about it, is the absolute, total humiliation of God. I, I gave a talk at a Presbyterian church in Westchester, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and one of the ladies had been to Caiaphas's house in Jerusalem, and she said, well, actually, she said Caiaphas had a basement in his house, yep. and in that basement, there were two cells. One cell was for groups of people, and the other cell was for an individual person. There was no way into the cell unless you were lowered down by ropes. And they think that's where Jesus spent the night. And she said, we went into that cell, and they shut the door. And she said, you wouldn't believe how black and dark that it was. But that's where he spent the night. And then in the morning, they hauled him back up. But they think that's where they put him after he was examined. Uh, by Caiaphas, but when you see what he suffered quietly, in a sense, and then when he gets to the end, the very end, and I tell people this, I said, if you have anybody you haven't forgiven, do it now. You might as well, because Jesus, look what Jesus did. Look at how people were ridiculing him all the way to the bitter end. They were making fun of him. Oh, if you're God, you can get down from the cross, all this stuff that they were hurling at him and the soldiers making fun of him. And he looks up, hmm. Jesus looks up and he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Look, he forgave them the very people that brutalized him. I said, can't we do that for people? People look sideways at us and we hate them. He said, look at us. We, we, we got to stop that. You know, that isn't hmm. what God's calling us to do. And people really see that. Um, I had people come yeah. up to me, like I said, many of the people are, have tears coming down their cheeks because they really see what Jesus did, the tremendous love that he had for us is beyond our comprehension. How could God do that for us? And, hmm. and, and rather than not talking about Jesus like we seem to be living in an age where you even mention the name of Jesus and people freak out, Right. Rather than be that way, we should be proclaiming him. That's what yes. I do. I said, because he's the dude. He's the <laughs> real guy. I mean, yeah. I mean, he is God. And sometimes just that, you know, the compelling uh, nature that, um, you know, I mean, there's that uh, misquote, as I understand it, of, of St. Francis of Assisi that tends to put a wedge between proclaiming the word and doing it. They're not different. You know, they're no. both essential. And um that that quote, you know, uh, preach the gospel, but when necessary, use words. It's no, it's, it's both. Fran no, Francis preached both. a lot of God. <laughs> yeah, right. But the, the sometimes there's there's a compelling, I think, uh, for certain people, right? You know, just the witness of someone living it out in a very extreme way. Sometimes will do more than all the sermons in the world, you know, for that yeah, person. Well, and I, I think of the um, so, for example, you, you mentioned a secundo pio seeing the image. I know how I feel when I was when I see the face. Yeah. Um, and we have so many uh, 
anecdotes have been shared on this channel and interviews of people having this this same experience that it reminds me a little of the uh, story of the martyrs of Sebast, I think it is. I was just double checking in uh, modern day Turkey. It was 40 <laughs> soldiers, early 300s. You know, they're, they're refusing to uh, give up uh, their faith, refusing to curse Christ. They get basically tied down on this, this frozen lake to just slowly freeze to death. And they're taunted with this warm bath, right? You know, if you guys just recant, you can come over here, got these warm baths for you. And yeah. they keep refusing. One guy finally apostatizes just, and I, I'm not excusing it, but I, I can imagine I'd be tempted to do it myself. He gets up and leaves and another soldier who's so amazed by the witness of these other 39 yeah. takes that guy's place and goes and dies instead. And I just think <sighs> sometimes the, the, the witness, you know, of, of seeing it, seeing the gospel in different ways through the saints or directly through Christ, you know, there's people... I wonder sometimes how many people saw what he did yeah. on the day of his crucifixion that we don't maybe hear about them in the gospel, but maybe their eyes are open that day. Oh yeah, you know, or even even the centurion, right? The, the, all the legends well, about the La centurion yeah, that lands him. He's referenced as a saint in the Coptic faith. Mm -hmm. uh, they think his name is Longinus. Yes, and, yeah. and and he became, but he not only, according to their tradition, he not only became a Christian, but he went back to die for the Lord to Jerusalem oh, because wow. soldiers were sent to get him when they found wow. he'd converted. And, and they said, look, you can take off. We won't take you back because we, we love you and we don't want, you know, he said, right. no, take me back with you. I'm willing wow. to go. And he was went he, back. Was he the one he who, whose hometown in Italy was traditionally Lanciano or, or it might be, I don't story? know. I don't know, but, I uh, look that up. Yeah. but, but he was an amazing guy because he yeah. saw everything. Right. I mean, I'm convinced he was there for when they ridiculed him, when the soldiers ridiculed him, when he was scourged. Yeah. He saw the whole ball game. Sure. And he saw his death. And so he observed the whole thing. And he's the one that said, surely this must be the son of God. I mean, it, that was darkness. It couldn't have been an eclipse of the sun, like people say, mm. because eclipse of the sun doesn't last that long. I mean, this was three hours. Mm -hmm. And they said that that darkness apparently was experienced in other cities as well at the same time. Hmm. Well, isn't that amazing? I mean, it's like, yeah. wow. <laughs> well, um, let me ask you this, Bill. I, I, yeah. we, I didn't, I didn't prep you or mention this ahead of time. I'm just curious because I've had a lot of people send in questions and stuff along the way and things that I, sometimes I'll send a link if I have it, but if I don't know, sure. I like to ask. So, um, uh, have you looked at or have you seen anything? I, I've, I've heard this somewhere before, not a whole lot, that there's some folks who um, posit that the shroud may have been related to, you know, or may have been the like the tablecloth from the Last Supper. Have you heard that that argument before? I've, yeah, I've, I have. That was, and, that know, was tricky, uh, put you'll forward see, like, by John Jackson, who was, it was okay. uh, rich. He was the uh, professor of physics at the Air Force Academy. Right. I didn't know he had, okay. What's, what, yeah, but he's what the one the that first on that? started that. <laughs> and I don't agree with that. Um, okay. The reason that I don't is, is firsthand, they said, it says in scripture that it was an expensive cloth. And right. people that have analyzed the structure of it say, yes, this was an expensive uh, piece of material, but it said Joseph of Arimathea, it was probably his own burial cloth. I mean, mm -hmm. it was his tomb they put him in. Right. And, 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 and also people don't realize that, um, you know, he said, well, I found evidence of food on the shroud. Well, it, it occurred to me that in the course of scourging, people throw up. That's one of the symptoms of what happens to you when you're scourged. You throw mm. up, you vomit. And most likely the dinner that he had had the night before, the, the last supper, the food came out and landed mm. on his body. And so when he was scourged and then when he, you know, when he, when he's up on the cross and everything, that stuff is on his, on his skin. And mm. when they put him in the shroud, that very likely that food could have rubbed off on the shroud. But I believe that it really was the burial cloth of Joseph of Arimathea. I don't think that it could have been the, the Last Supper, sure. tablecloth of the Last Supper. That that just, that didn't make sense. Uh, I'm particularly intrigued by, um, uh, uh, Justin Robinson was talking about this, you know, the, the co uh, coin expert talking about a lot yep. of the, the face on the, the Byzantine 
coins yes. or I tease him because, you know, the, I love the British pronunciation because he says Byzantine, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, Byzantine. Which yeah. Is, yeah, maybe he's saying yeah. it right and I'm saying it wrong. But yeah. but he he also was talking about and I've, this has come up a few times, too. I'm also intrigued by these different uh, theories or possibilities about the development of the Holy Grail mythos, you know, and, and the idea of, of is it possible that this burial shroud is the true, you know, vessel of, of the blood of the Lord? And so there's this, this just one example, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but this one sure. example, if nothing else, of, of all of these very uh, intriguing and, um, and potentially important discussion points that this opens up, you know, as well. Well, I had lunch with Guilio Fonti. Now, oh, yeah. Guilio is an interesting guy. He, he uh... I haven't spoken with him yet. I'd like to. Yeah. Yeah, he's a great guy. I, he probably would speak with you. Uh, sure. um, I had I had a great great time at lunch with him because he's the one that did a lot of the research on the coins mm -hmm. that date back to the year six hundred, and the face on the coin. See, back then you had to use the actual person or or item that you were creating the face of the coin on. Like if you did a picture of, of Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. You had to do it with Julius Caesar sitting there. I mean, that's how they did coins back then. And so he said that that basically um, those coins reflect the shroud. Like there's, you just can't walk around it. They have all the key features of the shroud yes. on those coins. And he knows, though they know that's the year 600 because it references the emperor who was, who was in, in charge at that time on the other side yep. of the coin. So That's I mean, Cheryl White and I talked about with the the art uh, aspect of it too, like like the very specific that you could miss quickly, but very specific inconsistent not inconsistencies, um, imperfections or or uh, asymmetrical features of of facial features, which you know, and it just it might be a leap. Some people would say, but I think it's a, a fair leap to say why would you arbitrarily create? Yes, especially if you're if you if you're claiming that you're trying to depict the the you know the son of God, you're trying to depict the incarnate Lord. I think the tendency in that Christendom sort of, you know, setting would be to perfect him, not to depict him with per very specific particular facial incongruities and stuff like that. That's, that's a really, I think, important piece of evidence for people to think about at least. Well, I, I think one of the things that you have to realize is that until the year 300, if you go to the uh, Callista catacombs in mm -hmm. uh, Rome, they have pictures of, of Christ that were done back in the year 300. Mm -hmm. They show him with, with short brown hair, youthful yes. face, yeah. all of that. Okay. But that's how they would have done pictures back then. And, but but that's that was the picture of Christ all the way up till they discovered in Edessa they discovered the the box that contained the shroud, which I believe came from Antioch mm. to Edessa because Persia came down to attack Antioch and they had right. to squirrel it away and hide it. And they did. And it wasn't discovered until uh, I guess it was around the year 600. Mm -hmm. But but they but they, it was discovered. And that's when some of the monks they believe took the picture, took a picture of a lot of them would, would literally sit in front of the shroud and do the picture off the face of the shroud. Right. And that's from the monastery of St. Catherine in Syria. That's when the first pictures of Jesus looking like his face on the shroud came out. Right. I have my door shut now, but on the other side of it, I have a little, it's like a lawn flag. I love that uh, uh, Panto Crator um, from St. Catherine's monastery. And oh, it's, wow. and I, okay. I, I always, I always loved it. And it's, it's, uh, um, when you, when you look at it with a lens to the, the shroud face, it's yeah. just, it's like, wait a minute, that's, that's very close. You know, there's some, some very specific <laughs> yeah. things on there that are, yeah. but that's, yeah, that, that bronze phallus that, that Justin found and was really looking at that one really blows my mind of, of like the yeah. stain on the forehead and just yeah, the whole bit. Right, like the specific, like the how many weaves in the hair there are. Like yeah, with three instead of two, or you know, it's yeah, just it, it's it's fascinating all of those those details. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, when you look at the Kodak negatives of of the back of Jesus, you can really see that his hair was in a ponytail. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way down to his waist in the back, but that's how rabbis wore their hair back then. 
Hmm. They wore it in ponytails, the younger rabbis. Hmm. And of course, Jesus fit that description. But uh, that that would be that would fit. Yeah. Well, and even little details like like I said before about the things that would be the case if it was legit, if it was authentic, and some kind, sometimes things that we haven't known about until more recent years of of, of things rediscovering certain details like sure. about crucifixion. And I think it was when I had Martha May on, she was talking about this. I think Cheryl may have mentioned this as well, but a few people have mentioned it um, before that I, I thought was really intriguing that um, I can't recall the name of the the beam. I, I'm forgetting the Latin name for it off the top of my head. Tibulum? It's escaping me, but yeah, the patibulum, like to carry the patibulum over the shoulder rather than the giant T-shaped cross that we normally see in religious art. But thinking about that, I even showed my students. I said, I had this, I forget what, I had a stool in my classroom. I didn't have a beam. I kind of picked it up and I was, you know, just doing it on the spot. I said, and I'm walking like this. I said, you know, what would you expect to see? And I walked them through, you know, you'd expect to see bruising or, you know, like, like abrasions, that sort of stuff on the shoulder. And then down below the shoulder blade on the other side. And I said, well, guess what? You know, that's, that's what you see when you do these closer examinations of the wound characteristics. It's just truly remarkable. Oh, they say that for him to have carried, you got to look at it this way. What had he gone through? He'd been up all right. night. He'd had the daylights beaten out of him. Right. And then they've taken him and, and, and they've scourged him within an inch of his life. Then they've taken him into the praetorium and he's, he's, he's hardly alive kind of. And they're, and they're mocking him, making fun of him as though he were this king. And the, the, he, there's no way the, the cross weighs about 350 pounds. Mm -hmm. The tibulum weighs between 60 and 80 pounds. That in and of itself, even though J yeah. Jesus was tough, you know, you, a lot of yeah. people don't realize, but carpenters back in Jesus's day were also stonemasons. Exactly. They yes. spent a good portion of their time building houses out of stone. So that's, that's the kind of, I mean, Jesus was tough. Mm -hmm. He He was no... He he was he was no he was taller than most people too. He was like six uh, five foot eleven, mm -hmm. and uh, weighed about one hundred and seventy five pounds. So he but he was tough, and yes. and and yet he'd had the daylights beaten out of him, so he could barely stand up. And they knew. See, the soldiers had to get him to the crucifixion alive. Right. That was what they had to do. That's why they grabbed. I think they could grab Simon of Cyrene like right off the bat when mm. they saw how badly beaten up he was. He was never going to make it there. Yeah. And so they recruited him and that, that started early on. But it still weighed 60 to 80 pounds. Well, and that's even like you know, I, I've had to uh, carry, uh, you know, the 50 pound bags of goat feed and stuff like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Like, you know, you get, you yeah. get a, a heavy bag of stones or something at, at, at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot sure. or something, you know, and I'm, I'm not a bodybuilder by any means. Like I'm, but I'm moderately strong. I think <laughs> and that yeah, is, you, sure. know, you really start panting, just like just walking to the, oh, yeah. the car in the parking lot, let alone you're going all the way down this, this Via Dolorosa while being beaten and yeah, kicked yeah, to the ground yeah. and just, it's yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah, the suffering. Mm. Well, I remember at one point in my life, I had to carry a hundred pound bag of rice up four flights of steps. <laughs> and, and it's like, I, by the time I got up there and I was young, I was in my, uh, my twenties and, and I mean, I didn't have much left in me by the time no. I got up to that fourth thing. It was like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, and that, and, and you, and like you said, you know, you hadn't probably spent a sleepless night, you know, no, I had been beaten, had the daylights a, beaten out of me and, and Caiaphas's house. Yeah. And yes, I mean, Goodness. I mean, let's face it, you know, it, it's just oh. be realistic. And, 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 and his body shows that that most likely mm. is what he did. He carried them because that's yeah. what they did with people back then. They right. carry the patibulum, <laughs> not the whole cross. They keep and, those and, things in the ground. Right. The stipes is they just the leave stipes. them in the ground rather than mm -hmm. dig a hole every time. Right. Because they don't, they're not <laughs> why, yeah. was smarter, not harder. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, they just, yeah, they leave you know, them in the ground and then they, 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 they know how to lash the particular right. limb onto the cross. Yep. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not defending, of course, anything about crucifixion, but just from the practical yeah. side of, you know, and I was in the army for 12 years. Like there's a, when, when you figure something out, you know, you just, <laughs> you just tend to stick with it. Right. And, uh, you know, these guys knew, knew what they were doing. Um, Oh, and that's the magnitude soldiers, of it. I, they'd done they'd done five hundred at a time. 
I was just going to say, because I think a lot of people just don't uh, understand the magnitude of how common this was. Like, this was just old hat. This is what they did every day, and we just can't conceive of it, you know? They had a big pit where they throw bodies and just leave the pit uncovered for a while, and it stunk like a yes. like crazy. But that's they throw the bodies in there, and animals would come by at night and eat their legs. And Jesus mm-hmm. saw all this. That's right. what we don't realize. Yeah. That these people lived three days on the cross, and Jesus, during his public ministry, walked by people that were on crosses. He yep. couldn't have avoided it. And I know some some people. There's different opinions about that yeah. show that uh, uh, that's on the Chosen. Uh, I, I tend mm-hmm. to love it. You know, there's a lot of wonderful uh, things in there, and and I've seen it really affect people and myself pretty profoundly. But even if if it's not a hundred percent geographically accurate, you know, there's this one scene in season two where they're walking into Jerusalem and they're passing the crucifixion site that's going on mm-hmm. that day. Mm-hmm. And I think they do a good job in that scene of at least getting you as the viewer to think about, you know, your ki- kids are walking past this. Yeah, like it's like everybody is. It's right outside yeah. the gate. This yeah. isn't yeah. you know behind walls. No, um, no, you know. And it's interesting because, and this is what I stress in my talk, is that when Jesus carried that patibulum, time stood still when he walked outside the city walls. Why? Because back then, the blood sacrifices, the entrails and all that stuff were thrown over the city walls, Mm. that that was the stuff they discarded. So when you were outside the city walls, that's why they kill people outside the city walls, because they're 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 bad boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and and, and, and when he walked, he he literally carried our sins. He became the blood sacrifice at that moment yeah. that all those bulls and oxes and sheep that they'd sacrificed prior to were leading up to what he just did. Right. I mean, that's how significant his journey outside the city walls was. And yeah, the scapegoat. You know, it's funny. Yeah. I, I love this. Yeah, the scapegoat. scripture, I do this go. all the time. I want to say it's, it's Leviticus. Uh, I, it's 17 or 18. It's somewhere in there. And the only reason I remember that is because yeah. everybody, everybody rips on Leviticus. I, I've read it many times. It's yeah. if you don't know what you're reading, you know, or what it's about, it can easily be something that turns you away. Like, what does this have to do with anything? But yeah. I remember one day I just, I was in a prayerful mood of just flipping somewhere in scripture. And I flipped open to Leviticus, that chapter, and it was the scapegoat. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks as I'm reading. It I was like, right here, this, this is it right here. This is <laughs> like, Jesus. Here. Here's the preview, you, got you know, it. thousands of years or 15, whatever, 14, 1500 years in advance. So you saw that. That's great. Yeah, you know, but this, like you had, he takes on the, the guilt. And, and I even said uh, to someone recently, I said, something I'd like to pursue more. And I really just started wondering about this is doing a little yeah. research on the blood before one of the recent interviews and, you know, AB blood group that always shows right, AB. up, um, AB's universal recipient. Mm-hmm. And I thought about it because, you know, you would immediately, you'd probably start off thinking about Jesus, you know, maybe you could make a connection to him being the universal donor because he's the Lord. But I thought, well, wait a minute, universal recipient intrigues me because could that be maybe, you know, right in God's grand design, could part of that be something for us now that we actually in this age, you know, understand a little bit more about blood groups and all that. Uh, might there be a little hint in that of of his universal drawing yeah. of all of our, our sins and our crosses and, and everything to himself, sure. right? The, the perfect representative of all humanity, you know, oh, wow, sure. what a neat connection there too, you know? Oh, no, it's it's just it's just remarkable when you think of what he suffered. And I, 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 I tend to think, you know, we sometimes, I think they did a good job. Mel Gibson's film, I thought was amazing. He did mm-hmm. a great job. Um. There were certain aspects that he did, you know, but he can't do everything perfectly. But no, right. But I I think he did a tremendous job with his movie that that was a monumental movie in so many ways. And at the same time, uh, when we really understand what Jesus did for us, it it blows my mind. His love for us was so great. You know, when he's when he's when he's in the the agony in the garden, he's in the garden of Gethsemane and 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 he's going through it. You know, it's ironic that in order to get there, you have to walk past all these all these uh, tombstones and everything in mm-hmm. order to get where he went after the the uh, Last Supper. And and so he's he's there and he's going through hell. Literally, he's getting hit with everything. But it, the everything was he knew all about the physical 
aspects, but it was also the psychological aspects that he knew he was going to get hit with, how people were literally going to reject him totally. Mm -hmm. Even though he's dying for us, they're going to reject him. And he saw that. I yeah. think that's what really blew him apart. Lord, you know, if it's possible, let this pass from me. But then he was so obedient to his to the father that he went through with it. But he knew what it was going to what it was going to cost. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, it, and it's in this day and age, too, I think, especially it's weird. You know, you have the um, to, to give the devil his due. You know, he's very crafty. Like you, you have these movements shaping so many of our thoughts, so many of our our perspectives today and the young people in a particular way, but all of us where, you know, you have such a self-referential, self-deifying, self-worshipping kind of element of society, right? Right. At the exact same time, you have a complete self-worthlessness, depression, anxiety, yeah. rocket, skyrocketing suicide culture because I'm not exactly. worth anything. These right. two extremes, none of neither of which is true, right? Yeah, like I true. am not God. My life is right. not about me. But I'm also not nothing. I'm not worthless. I, you know, look at exactly. how much he suffered for me because he's the one who is the key. You know, and it's just again, like I, I, it's it's an antidote, I think, to all of that. You know, obvious. Well, I mean, he is. You know, he is the antidote. But this this particular topic, you know, um, try as we might to try to go through all of the scientific details and the evidence. I just more and more, I'm finding myself getting into that stuff and exploring it, but always coming back to. Uh, emphasizing, I think, how important it is not to overlook the evidence of people's subjective personal experience with with Christ through the shroud as well. Which some people will hit me up on YouTube and blast me for that and mock me for that. That's okay. We'll chat. <laughs> but right, right, right. I think right, that's right. important as well, right? Not to overlook that. I think you have to look at the shroud as as being probably the greatest evangelistic tool of our age. Mm. There's nothing that comes close to it because. Um, and, and I'm saying this not 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 to downgrade the Muslims, but mm -hmm. it's interesting that the Muslims don't believe he rose from the dead. Right. And as the evidence is surfacing, that the evidence for the resurrection, they think like thirty five thousand uh, watts of power uh, was exhibited at the resurrection. And that's the minimum. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that that was such it was like a mini nuclear explosion is what occurred at the resurrection. You know, they said the stone was blown away. Yeah. The soldiers were knocked out on the ground. I mean, they said an angel came and explained, but I still think that, that the actual resurrection itself was just, they, they say it's this huge burst of power because they say that the image on the shroud is the exact same density and cons and, and, uh, and, and brightness throughout the whole 14 and a half feet. There's no variation. Right. And for yeah. that to happen had to have happened extremely fast. Right. And, and, that's, not and it's, it's, it's a very, very different phenomenon from the Tilma, for example, which we're also, right. I'm, I'm starting to explore that on this channel too. But, yeah. but, you know, researchers who have said that that, you know, appears to be basically one brush stroke, so to speak. Like there's this one event, like it's not a right. process really. It, it's, it's something right. we can't conceive of. <laughs> right? oh, it's, it, it's, it all happens so fast. Yeah, that that uh, um, that it, it, but it all but it does make sense that mm -hmm. this is this is what happened at the resurrection. And if this has the proof of the resurrection, then I believe the Muslims need to relook at the shroud yeah. um, because they believe he was buried in some other town. But we believe right. that he rose from the dead. And, well, and I've and, also heard a lot of there's there's a lot of interesting evangelical. Uh, evangelistic, whatever you call it, you know, uh, potential here with with our brothers and sisters, you know, in, in the Islamic sure. faith, because of also how many of them, uh, there's a lot of them, I believe, that also deny that he died at all, right, or that right, it was right, he was switched. Right. So either way, too, for those who don't believe yes. that he died, you know, any, I, I would, I, I would say it'd be interesting to see sort of a Muslim physician. Right. right. Take a hard right. look, for example, at, at how does he process something like that or she process something like that? You know, no, this guy died. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, he, he did. And, and, and right. he, but this evidence right. in the shroud for the resurrection okay. is a mind blower. Absolutely. Because that, in essence, says, hey, 
you know, Muhammad was, was a great man and he was trying to do what he thought was right. But the point is that Jesus did rise from the dead. And Amen. how do you walk around that? Because the shroud right. is even verifying that. The more they get into how did the image get on the shroud, the more they understand. They think it was a type of uh, of radiation um, that was ultra was it background ultraviolet, ultraviolet radiation? Um, yeah, they yeah. think it mm -hmm. was some form of ultraviolet. It was a light event, mm -hmm. and because it was a light event, um, that that's um, you know yeah. that 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 changes the, the the whole thing. Yeah. Well, he's he's described as the light. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I mean, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So I, I think yep. that Wonderful. I think that's what we have here, Mike. That when you yeah. when you even though you've had several people come and talk, I think it's crucial because I don't think we've had anything. You know, we believe. I mean, I believe as a Catholic that the Eucharist is the actual body and blood of Christ. Okay. Yeah. But but the truth is, uh, when you look at the shroud, that's showing us that. Uh, you know, Jesus literally is who he said he was. He rose from the dead, the whole ball game. It's like a testimony to the reality of Christ that he gave yeah. us for this day and age of unbelief. Because, you know, you could have everything laid out perfectly as to why Jesus is who he is. And people still wouldn't believe because they have a certain mindset that says, no, I don't want to believe. But mm -hmm. you have to look at it realistically. What what have we found physically speaking, that validates. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Bill, I, we could probably talk for hours, I'm sure. And, I, and I'd love to have you back on at some point. You know, we uh, I circle back from time to time with, with a bunch of guests because it's just so inexhaustible of a topic. Of oh, course. It's, it's just, you know. And I've spoken know. in jails. I've spoken at the biggest jails yes. in Pennsylvania and stuff. And, and MIT, Wonderful. I spoke there too. So wonderful. it's a message all around the world that needs to be heard. Amen. Well, Bill Wingard, thank you so much. I've got the, the links below. Anything else you want to share but before we, we end here? Is, you know, uh, anything you have coming up soon or anything else you want to point um, out to folks? I do have links? a talk. I have a talk in, uh, in Claremont, uh, New Hampshire, September 9th. Okay. And they're evidently billing it all over the state of New Hampshire, the uh, Ooh, shroud wonderful. and so forth. But it's for the 200th anniversary of, their, of the church there. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that's my next major talk. I have another one that's been scheduled for Lent of next year, but um, I, I went for a time where I nearly died uh, several months ago. I, I mm. had uh, I had a bad reaction to one of the vaccines. Oh, wow. Okay. It really killed me. And, oh, my. Uh, so I, I recovered from that. And good. I figured, well, Lord, you got me back, so you want me to get back into this. There you go. So that's what I'm doing. Well, good. Well, God bless. We're, we're lucky to have you. Fortunate. Blessed. It's good <laughs> to be here. Luck. Thank you so yeah, much, amen. Mike. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bill. Yeah, God bless you and take care. Okay, you too. <laughs> Bye-bye. What a delight. So I want to thank you all very much for stopping by today. Please make sure you check out the links below. I've got some links to Bill's website, to a presentation that he gave that uh, we mentioned in there, a couple other things that came up in our chat just for you to consider and to kind of go deeper into. And as always, God bless you all. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care. <laughs>